try to figure it out for the next presentation. Um, we have a full paper presentation now on follow-up on the learning analytics readiness instrument that has been presented in... 14? 14. 14, so two years of maturity between now, follow-up on the uh, readiness instrument. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Pastilli. I'm a director of assessment and planning for student affairs at IUPUI. Megan Oster is also here. She's a graduate doctoral student at the University of Michigan. She'll, you'll hear from her in a bit. Um, and we are doing kind of a reprise and a, a follow-up to the research we presented in Indianapolis in 2014. Um, so what we were able to do, what, so this is what we're going to talk about because good form always says, tell them what you're going to tell them. Um, so hopefully we're going to get through all of these things. As you have questions, um, you're welcome to hold them. You're also welcome to ask them in the middle if something doesn't make sense. Uh, whatever works best for you. Before we do get started, though, I do also want to acknowledge Kim Arnold, who is here today as well. Uh, Kim's with the University of Wisconsin uh, and was really instrumental in helping us design the original Larry and through the analysis of this process as well. Um, and he's still involved in this process, just not part of this particular paper. Um, so the Larry initially was rooted in a realm of a need for reflection. We really felt that institutions had to do some cross-disciplinary uh, reviews and understanding of where their expertise lied, where their skills lied, uh, and really what the attitudes surrounding analytics were on their individual campuses. This involved multiple levels of folks, so everybody from executive officers of the institution through the faculty, the staff, technical staff, support staff, and then students themselves. Um, at the end of the day, we started with an alpha version um, that had nine institutions and the very original, even our, I think our zero instrument started with 150-ish items. Um, the alpha then, we, after the alpha analysis, we refined it down to 90. Um, and so we ended up with the learning analytics readiness instrument. The 90 item instrument is what we're talking about today and then how we've refined it even further. So our framework was really on three main points. We wanted to keep it as short as possible. I know 150 items in short doesn't seem the same. The goal was to reduce those items, and I think we've gotten to a point of manageability there. We also want to look at practicality. Um, these, this is a perceptions-based uh, instrument. It is indirect assessment. Um, there's no real direct assessment in terms of what are you doing now as much as who do you, what do you think as a user is going on with these various components associated with analytics at a given campus. And then we wanted to be proactive. We were trying to fill the middle space between the environmental scans that were out there in terms of all of the various tools that were available. And then at the time in 2012 when we started working on this, the maturity index from Educause and ECAR was very much in vogue. Um, but maturity assumes you have something. Even to be immature, you still have to have something in order to be immature at it. Um, and so we were looking for that middle space that could fill the realm of how do you know you're ready to invest in the tool and then begin a path of maturity. Um, and so that was the proactive component. We based our work in organizational learning, and this is not the prettiest representation on the screen, but basically the point is that it's an iterative cycle, and it's the same iterative cycle that we see through assessment processes and that we've talked about a lot at some of the sessions here already. We start with questioning in terms of what we know. We move into looking at both his historical and an empirical analysis of the data. We go on to model the solution in a way that seems to make sense to those of us, to, to us as the researchers. And then we model that, we, excuse me, we examine that model we implement the model once we feel that it's at a point of implementation. We reflect on the process that's associated with that realm. We consolidate to new practice, and we go back to questioning to ensure that where we started was where we wanted to be was actually where we were. Uh, and we continue this iterative process. There's also a realm of ethics and readiness that's very much associated with this world. Um, the application and adoption of learning analytics need to have an ethic or a realm of ethics attached to them, um, based in beneficence, but also in the realm of um, Jenny Swenson, who presented on the topic of ethics at this conference in 2014, talks about ethical actions that guide learning analytics by the philosophy of use, the motivation for use, and working towards the desire to, quote, do better by the institution, the instructor, and the discipline as a whole. So this really is about reflection and self-improvement and really growing to a realm of doing the most amount of good for the most amount of people, but doing so in an open frame of readiness. So making sure that transparency, and even though we know transparency is also a, a realm of control, uh, but being as transparent as, process, uh, as possible, having an inclusionary process, uh, allowing as many folks as wanting to, to be able to participate and contribute their information 
to or their thoughts and their uh, their own perceptions to the Larry itself, uh, as well as appropriate management of resources and personnel as, as institutions, particularly for institutions that are funded publicly, uh, to the extent that we are still funded publicly. Um, there's a joke out there that state institutions were once state funded and then state supported and now state located. Uh, and that's, <laughs> for the United States, that's, that's a very true notion. Um, but in that realm then, we also have to appropriately determine who should be where and when and how. This isn't about necessarily job elimination as much as it's a potentially about efficiency of uh, who's doing what, when, and where, uh, and being able to move down that frame. The other component here is that leaders of an institution need to be involved in this process. And I don't know that this is a surprise to any of you, uh, but what we have found is that they are consumers and protectors of information, both learned and applied. They need to be trained to use this information. Uh, and then there's also this a care that's necessary with collection and analysis and the use of our data. Um, being able to top down and bottom up have an understanding of what's going on is really important, we found, to the success of the implementation of analytics on a campus. Uh, personally, I worked with a campus as part of a project um, that in three years bought three different systems. Um, not, a good use of manage, uh, not a good use of funding or resource, and certainly not uh, a great deal of care being taken with collection analysis and the use of what they know. And so there's an opportunity here for uh, kind of a top-down, bottom-up approach to meet in the middle to really ensure that um, not only is the administration getting what it wants, but those in the, in the field, so to speak, are also able to contribute to the knowledge that's being produced in that, set, in that setting. My last slide for a minute, and then Megan's going to take over. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of the survey design, um, it really was an opportunity for folks to participate in the Larry. Uh, the survey is designed for multiple folks across an institution to take. Um, that is then averaged into a, a mean score for the entire institution. But the whole point of having it being taken by multiple people at an institution is because when you have everything regressed to the mean, you only get one point, right? But when you're able to disaggregate by various roles, and, and Megan will talk about this in a second, um, you get to actually see what's contributing to the various scores that are there. And so you can find your areas of, uh, to, um, to address in a timing frame that allows you to both implement and address, the, address at the same time. Um, there's an opportunity then to, so once you participate, you obtain your results. This reflective process ideally is done as a group, so the folks who took it are actually going to be, the, ideally going to be at least the ones in the room, or at least the, the administrators who said, yes, the Larry's a good idea, let's all take it, um, to sit down and actually look and see, so where are our challenges, make appropriate changes. And then it's designed to be iterative, so that you could take the Larry again and come back and um, take, uh, see where you are after having made some institutional changes across the board. We have not done reliability testing, so hold on for that in two years. We'll come back to you with that information. We'll just continue the every two year cycle. But that's our goal, um, amongst other things, is to be able to look at that. Uh, but with that, um, all right, this is my last slide. Um, so as I said, the, the original version had 139 questions. Uh, our analysis reduced it to 90, uh, and our original factors focused largely on ability, data, <laughs> culture and process, governance and infrastructure, and overall readiness. Um, so that 90-item survey was then administered to a large group of sta stakeholders using essentially convenient sampling. We went to about 25 institutions who we knew were at least somewhat active or considering being active in the frame of analytics and said, would you be interested in finding a bunch of people on your campus to take this? And they said, sure. And so we had a wide range of responses from these various institutions over about a three month time span. Um, and from that point, I'll let Megan continue the story and then I'll come back up and talk a little bit about our implications and our limitations. Thank you. So like Matt said, I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about our um, just general sample that we have and some of the results um, that we found. So through our factor analysis as well as some um, regression results that we have. So for our participations, or for our participants, we had about 24 institutions, like Matt said, um, and 560 participants for this iteration of the Larry. And as you can see, we um, predominantly surveyed research universities, our very high research activity universities. So these are Carnegie classifications. We also had four institutions who were um, grouped as associate, 
public research large or back baccalaureate arts and science or baccalaureate diverse fields, um, 24 respondents from those institutions, and then five institutions who are master's large um, or research institutions who had high research activity, and there are 129 respondents from there. And then from our very um, high research institutions, there were 30, 337 respondents and 15 institutions. Um, overall, our response rates range from 50% to 100%. Um, from our institutions with the majority of our institutions with a response rate above 80%. And uh, just so you know, for the regression results, we use the research universities, very high research institutions as our reference group. One, because they're the largest, and two, because typically on average, they were the highest on all of the factors that fell out from our factor analysis. So, for our participants by role, uh, we did have to collapse some of our um, different roles that we had just to create what we call large enough groups. But what we did before we collapsed this, which is kind of an iterative process that we went through for this analysis, um, we made sure that there weren't any statistical differences between the factors before we grouped people together. So these groups um, didn't have statistically different uh, responses, so they, they go together. So overall, we had a lot of academic deans, uh, institutional leaders, as well as IT professionals. Uh, and when you'll see the regression results, this is noted on those slides, but we use IT professionals as our reference category. One, because they're a large group, and two, because we um, theorize that IT professionals are individuals who know a lot about learning analytics um, at particular institutions, so they know about the infrastructure and what's going on at the institution. So for our, our factor analysis, we did an exploratory factor analysis. We used principal axle um, because we believe that the variance was shared among the various factors. Only items on a five point scale were used. So some of the original factors on the Leary were on a seven point scale. We actually ended up um, taking those out. And um, questions with over 70% response rate were used just because missing data can uh, have an issue with factor analysis. And then questions regarding data collection were removed because we found that the majority of responses on data collection were very high because institutions are really good at collecting data now. And what we're finding through the Larry analysis is that yes, institutions are good about um, collecting data, but it's about managing that data and analyzing that data that um, is really what's important for um, learning analytics. So when we did our first first factor analysis, we did it unforced, which means that we just kind of let the data fall out as, as it would. And what we found using two different um, ways to cut the data, we found 35 factors that had an eigenvalue of one or above. Or if we use the screen plot method of kind of looking where the elbow was, we found two. So obviously those are two very different kind of answers for our solution of what are the best factors uh, from this data. So what we did um, after realizing those uh, kind of two very different uh, factors that were falling out, we did an iterative process of forcing the different items into two factors, three factors, four factors, five factors, all the way up to um, 10, 12 factors to see what actually made sense. And what we found is that five factors made the most sense of grouping the questions together. So through this iterative process of trying to find what works, we found that five was the best for um, our data just by looking at it. So then after we determined that five factors were probably the best, we went through a process of cleaning the factor analysis, which means that items that weren't loading on any of the five factors with an absolute value of 0.3, they were removed. And then any items that were cross-loading across different factors of above 0.3 were also removed. And then this was done through an iterative process until we basically found a clean factor analysis where items loaded um, on one factor, they didn't cross-load and all items load. And then after that, we did, or somewhere along the way, we did a sensitivity check, which means that we did um, conditional factor analysis and we did it for each institution. So we basically um, just analyzed the data for one particular institution and looked to see how the factor analysis fell out. And then we also did that by role. And what we found is that in general, the factors hold. So overall, they group 
um, in the way that I'll show you here in a second. And then if you look at it by institution and by role, they also group in that similar way. So for um, the new readiness factors that are falling out of the beta analysis, we have culture, data management expertise, data analysis expertise, and then we have a communication and policy application, and then well as training. And as you can see, this culture factor um, has 22 items on it, which means that it has 22 questions that are related to culture. And one of the example questions is, my institution has a culture that accepts the use of data to make decisions. Some of the other ones are um, reports are routinely informed departmental decisions. My institution has had conversations regarding the sustainability of an analytics effort. And then in practice, my institutional leaders are publicly committed to the use of analytics and data-driven decision making. So you can see that these questions kind of talk a lot about buy-in as well as um, building routines around um, data analytics. For data management expertise, there's eight questions for that. And one of the example questions and some others that I'll read for you, my institution has the ability to store increasingly large volumes of data. So this is kind of more about, is my institution able to get my hands around all of the data that's actually out there? Um, some other ones are, my institution has the ability to analyze, or I'm sorry, uh, has professionals with knowledge and expertise in, in maintaining complex data um, stores or warehouses manipulating data from multiple sources and platforms to conform to institutional specifications. So again, this is about getting data together and getting data to talk to each other. And then data analysis expertise, there's six of them. And this talks more about basically having the personnel who can run analysis and be data scientists on all of this data that's sitting around in these um, warehouses that are hopefully connected. So an example question from that, um, would be uh, institution has professionals with mathematical or statistical expertise in advanced statistical techniques, um, such as path analysis or structural equation modeling. The um, final two are more about communicating and getting um, data analytics information out there. So for communication and policy, there are seven questions for that. My institution has professionals with business Acclium in marketing and publicity. And then for training, there's three questions, which I know some people will probably question that, but um, literature says that a factor can hold together with three um, questions in it. And this is about um, basically having people out there who are able to train others in what um, learning analytics is. So some more psychometrics about the factors. One, there's 46 items now total on the Larry. So we've reduced it down from 90 to 46, so we about halved it, uh, which is great. We um, And our alpha is 0.95, which is great, which just means that the items themselves have internal consistency, and then 88% of the variance is explained. We also have some descriptive statistics about our factors. So um, in general, institutions are pretty high on data management expertise expertise, data analysis, the communication policy, and the training aspect. The culture um, factor is where um, institutions are a little bit lower than other things, so getting that buy-in and getting the routines around is where people perceive that to be a little bit less. Regarding skewness, um, everything is a little bit negatively skewed, indicating that um, the tail is long on the left side. Uh, and then for um, kurtosis, you're looking for a value of about three there, so the, the two data, uh, data expertise ones are pretty good. For culture, communication, and training, the, the peaks are a little bit more narrow than what you would expect from a normal bell curve. But then for our um, alphas and our eigenvalues, everything has a very high alpha as well as all of our eigenvalues are over one. So we um, basically concluded that they hold together very well. So if we start to use these factors and um, roles and institutional types, which are the three things that I've talked about, we um, basically did regressions to figure out if we could predict individual institutional score and role, or the scores um, by using the role and the institution. So what we find, and again, this is in comparison to the IT professionals, is that 
in general, academic deans and faculty members are lower on these different, or have a perceived value lower um, than IT professionals. And in general, it's about a quarter to almost a point. So on training, it's almost a point. Um, but for things like culture and data analysis, it's about a quarter of a point lower than IT professionals. And then for uh, data management and the communication and policy application, it's about a half a point. And the other thing that's really important um, about this is that across roles, when compared to IT professionals, individuals, when you're holding institutional um, context, holding their Carnegie classification constant, you'll see that uh, across roles, people think that training isn't going so well at institutions. So um, they just don't think that either that there be, they're perceiving that training is either isn't available or it's not going so well, or they're just not necessarily being taught a lot about learning analytics and what is happening with learning analytics. So if you look at these results by Carnegie classification while you're holding the role constant, one interesting thing that popped out for us is that for master's large and research high institutions, in general, on average, they are higher on culture than the research university very high. And the way that we thought about this is that these institutions are smaller and a little bit, um, potentially smaller, not necessarily, but in general, they're a little bit more focused on teaching and the learning aspect of it. So um, these institutions are getting behind the buy-in and putting those routines in place um, compared to the very high institutions. And, and the, and the data infrastructure. They're able to get their hands around their data a little bit um, easier than the other institutions. And then um, the other results that, were, that we want to highlight are master's institutions are potentially a little bit lower than our uh, very high research institutions on data management expertise, the analysis and the communication and policy. Just slightly lower on data management and the policy and then a little bit lower on the data analysis aspect of it. So it might be that they need to potentially hire or um, train some people on additional knowledge about data, um, data analysis expertise. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is that training isn't significant for our institutional types, which could indicate that all of that um, variance is being eaten up by role. So regardless of what institution um, you're at, training in general um, probably needs to be beefed up a little bit. So I'm going to pass it back to Matt. And he's going to talk about applications. Yes, the so what part of, uh, of the presentation. Um, we've got a few things. Uh, first off, talking about practice. Um, we were able to validate our concepts using factor analysis and using the, the much larger data set that we had. Um, in full disclosure, our original data set had around 100 um, cases that we examined. Um, and so just enough to do a factor analysis, not a lot to, not enough to be able to hold a great deal of stock in it, but enough to be able to kind of push us down the road. Uh, 540 respondents gives us a lot more latitude there. Um, it really helps us pinpoint where efforts ought to be focused. And those efforts can range from remediation to some extent, and I use that word very, very broadly, but in terms of getting folks on board or getting people to understand what it is that's trying to be done. Um, and it can also be used as a reference at a point of, because we were looking at role type, you can do, to some extent, specific interventions with specific groups to bring them up to where they need to be. Um, and it also helps us to understand the institutional context that are out there. We understand the research high institution very, very well right now. Um, not as much the smaller institutions, the two-year, the master's institutions. There's a lot of work to be done there. That's a limitation, so you'll hear me say that again. Um, another implication there here, here, though, is on institutional learning. This was designed to be a reflective process, and that reflection was designed to be a group-oriented process. So it would facilitate a conversation uh, across different members of an institution so that everybody could get on the same page. Um, it is the, the institution I referenced earlier that bought three things in three years didn't really talk to itself. They didn't interact with the users. It was, they were centrally made decisions that someone decided, well, we didn't see anything, and so we're going to move on to the next best thing or what we think is the next best thing, as opposed to actually reaching out to the users and saying, what did you think? How did that go for you? What would you have liked to see differently? Because you can change implementation, you can change algorithms, you can change a lot of things, but none of, that things none of those things happened. 
which is a direct attribute of the culture conversation as well. The culture at a, at a, at a campus has to be inclusive enough to facilitate those conversations in an honest uh, frame so that folks who invested the money aren't going to get that out of shape if everybody doesn't like it or if it's not working the way they wanted to, and vice versa in case the faculty who really advocated for something and that was what was faculty, staff, whomever advocated for something and that that was purchased or implemented and then it didn't work at all. So it's a two-way conversation of having a culture of both appreciation and understanding of what's going on as well as um, iteration uh, I think is a, is a really key part there. Um, having that iterative process in terms of recognizing that where you are today is not where you're going to be in the fullness of time. Um, the other piece here is that this was a mode of feedback, uh, an opportunity for an institution to really look at itself, both at an aggregate level as well as an individual factor level, and then across multiple types of multiple roles at an institution. Um, there's an opportunity here then for outside feedback to be provided to these various roles uh, as a realm of scaffolding the institution uh, and providing support to an institution as they move forward. The whole point here, like I said, was to fill that middle space between being ready to get something and being ready to become immature on the path to maturity. Um, our next steps are to create this feedback in a way so that institutions can get um, at least factor level, ideally in the fullness of time we're hoping for in, um, item level feedback to kind of address very specific aspects of, of the tool. Um, we do need to do some normalization uh, to various institutional characteristics so that at the end of the day we can apply this across the board. Right now it's a one size fits all and for the purposes of what we're doing that fits, but it's not ideal. Uh, so moving forward that's something we'll be looking, for, looking towards. There are ethical issues that need to be addressed. Uh, we do use ethics as a frame and yet ethics does not come out at all in, um, in any of our items or any of the feedback. Um, and so those are, that's something that conceptually we need to try to address. Uh, and our anecdotal evidence suggests that the feedback that we were able to create and curate uh, was both helpful and useful, uh, but it's wholly anecdotal. Or uh, as another way, it was uh, very much artisanally uh, curated data and not necessarily found via a survey. Um, our limitations, we do have uh, some sample concerns in terms of we are not broadly representative in the United States. Um, not all Carnegie classifications were represented and those that were, we clearly have an oversampling of uh, very high institutions. Uh, and as I said before, this is based in perceptions. It's an indirect measure. Um, that's both a limitation, but it's also the, really the best way of understanding what's going on in a given campus. Our next steps is to move this into some form of production deployment. Uh, we've partnered with the Gardner Institute as well, which is an organization that focuses on excellence in the undergraduate uh, experience, as well as with Unison. Each is going to use the tool in slightly different ways, uh, but we're also looking at a broader production deployment that uh, pretty much any institution can have access to in the fullness of time. We also want to continue to analyze the data, how institutions use feedback, what types of feedback are the most productive, uh, most efficient uh, and allow institutions to move forward the fastest. Um, and our takeaways, institutional role and context matters when folks are evaluating their ability to implement uh, learning analytics. Um, this is an iterative process. It really does need to be focused on how organizations learn and those components factored in. And then at the end of the day, these learning analytics is not going away. It's only become more and more prevalent as evidenced by the fact that we've doubled in size at this gathering in two years uh, and probably quintupled since it's original. Um, and so the, the more that we can engage in this topic, the better off we're going to be. And I think I have a minute and a half for questions. Uh, Megan and I are happy to entertain whatever you've got. <laughs> Is Michael Brown here? Hi, we'll Michael's in the back. back Michael's one of our authors as well, but he decided that he uh, would leave the speaking duties to us. So just want to acknowledge him as well. Questions, guys? No questions, great. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I know, I'm really glad to hear you talking about the ethics and your work that piece in and that there's so much um, of what you're talking about that recognizes uh, relationship building.
if there is anything like uh, a set of recommendations that might emerge about how you structure that conversation mm -hmm. at campuses. In other words, for example, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to approach instructors at my campus to talk about learning analytics because they're going to run and hide, mm -hmm. but I can approach them about curriculum. I can approach them about student success mm -hmm. and what falls directly within their sense of agency rather than using a term that seems to expose their lack of expertise. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have other insights or observations that's um, I have personal ones, but none of them that are coming from the research. Uh, in large because we haven't we haven't asked those questions. We haven't looked to see, you know, how are you using this cam this information on your campuses. That being said, um, the work that the Gardner Institute is doing with this tool, um, I've worked with them to develop a set of uh, templates basically to kind of analyze the results and get an understanding of what are they going to do next. Um, and so ask me in about six months, and I'll have a much better understanding of how did institutions actually turn around and use this. They have a, um, a system called the Analytics Process Collaborative, where they're bringing institutions together into a, a data sharing uh, and a model sharing realm. Um, and this was the delirious part of that process, where all the institutions had multiple folks from their campuses take it, clearly, uh, and then come back and, and then have a dashboard to be able to look at what did they learn from the folks on their campuses in terms of where they are from a readiness standpoint, and then what are they going to do about that? And I think that's where you're getting to, right, is what do we do about this notion of, all right, so we've got a bad culture, how do we fix that? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, that's an institution-specific question, I think, in the fullness of time. Um, that's definitely a place to go, uh, but I don't think we're there yet, and I don't know that I can give you a whole lot of anything beyond uh, a non-answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a... One more question. <laughs> so one more question. First, technically, you know, you have to relabel the Carnegie classification category. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, we went for uh, expediency no, and we understandability. For when you did the survey. Right. Yeah. Um, you have 22 items under culture, which suggests either you could reduce it to eight items and still have a pretty good reliable scale, or there are sub components to culture, one of which may be ethics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that may be a way to kind of incorporate that and build that into things that are more actionable by articulating. I actually had that thought while, while Megan was talking about it, that there are probably some subscales inside of there. Um, and some that, uh, locked. there's some experts on our respective campus that we can probably engage to dig into that a little bit more. But thank you, Vic. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.